Uh, good evening. I apologize for being a bit late. Uh, Dr. Chen has had a rather full schedule today, and uh, we were told to uh, take our time and hurry. But anyway, we're here. Uh, my name is Bob Yang, and on behalf of ISU Committee on Lectures, I welcome you all to this evening's lecture. Uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Long Chiu Chen, and Dr. Chen uh, is the native Formosan. Uh, he graduated summa cum laude from College of Law, Taiwan University in 1958. In 1960, uh, he came to the States and attended Northwestern University, where he received his Master of Laws degree. And subsequently, uh, he went to Yale Law School and received his Doctor of the Science of Law degree in 1964. Uh, Dr. Chen is the, uh, a, 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 an author and co-author of several books, including uh, Formosa, China, and the United Nations. Uh, the second book is called The Ind Independence and Nation Building of Taiwan. Uh, the third book, uh, Human Rights and World Public Order. Uh, in writing this book, he is now collaborating with professors uh, Harold D. Laswell and Meyer S. McDougall. Uh, currently, Dr. Chen is the uh, Secretary for External Affairs of the World United Formosans for Independence. And tonight, he will talk to us on Sino-American relationships and the problem of Taiwan. Dr. Chen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored and delighted to be here tonight. During President Nixon's visit to China, the press praised how skillful President Nixon was in manipulating <coughs> chopsticks. Do you know how he did acquire that skill? He acquired that skill after long years of practicing at the banquet tables of Chiang Kai-shek. <laughs> President Nixon and his party were well fed and lavishly entertained by his Chinese host during their recent visit to China. When Mr. Nixon was about to leave Shanghai for the United States, Zhou Enlai presented him with a bill, Taiwan. This was Mr. Nixon's payment. Let me quote. The United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China, and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. It, affirm, it reaffirms its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. With this prospect in mind, it affirms the ultimate objective of the withdrawal of all U.S. forces and military installations from Taiwan. In the meantime, it will progressively reduce its forces and military installations on Taiwan as the tension in the area diminishes, unquote. These words are from the Shanghai communique of February 27, 1972. The general feeling among the Taiwanese is that they are once again betrayed by the cynical big power politics that treat people as if they were pawns. The Taiwanese feel betrayed, not because of a President Nixon's announcement to withdraw U.S. forces from Taiwan. After all, it is the U.S. military support 
that has kept Chiang Kai-shek's exile regime in power and helped perpetuate its reign of terror and martial law in Taiwan for over two decades, thereby frustrating the Taiwanese aspirations for self-determination and independence. The Taiwanese feel betrayed because their beloved home island for centuries is by one stroke said to be a part of China. And they are cast to the mercy of, quote, all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait, unquote. In purporting to dispose of the future of Taiwan, Mr. Nixon ignores entirely the wishes and the existence of the principal party concerned, that is, the 13 million native Taiwanese who make up 87% of Taiwan's population and who do not identify with China. On the one side of the Taiwan Strait, there's a nuclear power of 800 million Chinese, and on the other is a subjugated island state of 15 million, 30 million Taiwanese and two million nationalist Chinese. What would be the fate of the 13 million native Taiwanese if, according to the Nixon Joe formula, 800 million Chinese on the one side and two million Chinese on the other are going to dictate the future of Taiwan? The implication is quite obvious. The fear of a bloodbath by Peking is indeed uppermost in the minds of many Taiwanese. Taiwan, also known as Formosa in Portuguese, is not a part of China. Taiwanese are not Chinese and do not wish to be a part of China any more than Americans are English or wish to be a part of England. By the way, I will use Taiwan and Formosa interchangeably, Taiwanese and Formosans interchangeably. Separated from China by the 100 mile wide Formosa Straits, the Formosan people for centuries have been living in an island environment different from that of the Chinese people, and undergoing experiences distinctly Formosan. They have developed distinct culture, distinct identity perspective of Taiwanese, and their quest to be masters of their own destiny. Noted as the pawn of the Orient, the Taiwanese people have had a long history of struggling against foreign domination and exploitation. Taiwanese ancestors migrated to the island of Taiwan at about the same time the pilgrims landed at Plymouth and for the same reason, to seek freedom and a new frontier. During the 17th century, Foreign powers, notably the Portuguese, Spaniards, and the Dutch, as well as dissident Chinese elements, competed to control the island of Taiwan. In 1683, the Manchu Dynasty, also known as the Qing Dynasty of China, purported to annex Formosa by decree but it is questionable if China, if China ever exercised sufficient effective control to perfect its title to Taiwan according to international law. A popular Taiwanese saying has aptly described the situation this way, quote, every three years a small rebellion 
every five years a big revolt, unquote. Indeed, in the early 1870s, the Chinese government stated to Japan that Formosa was outside its jurisdiction, and thus China could not be held responsible for what Formosans had done to Japanese nationals in Formosa. In the wake of the European and Japanese scramble for colonial interest in the area, the Manchu government suddenly realized the strategic and commercial importance of Taiwan. Thus, in 1887, the Manchu government proclaimed Taiwan a province of China in its attempt to actually annex Taiwan. But eight years later, China was defeated by Japan. As a result, China ceded Formosa to Japan in perpetuity by the conclusion of the Treaty of Shimonoseki in 1895. The Chinese could not care less about the cession of Formosa to Japan. Li Hongzhang, the viceroy of the Qing government, who negotiated the Treaty of Shimonoseki with Japan, wrote, let me quote, this land of the brown robbers, Taiwan, was a vile spot in which no man would ever care to live. It may not be known generally, but as early as 1873, when complaints came to Tianjin from British traders, I earnestly memorialized the throng to offer Taiwan to the English government to do with the wretched island as they saw fit." Unquote. At that time, the reaction on the part of the Taiwanese was to establish an independent Republic of Taiwan in May 1895. And that, by the way, was the first republic in Asia. Though, unfortunately, that republic was soon suppressed by the Japanese. As a result, Formosa became a Japanese colony from 1895 to 1945. And needless to say, during that period, the Taiwanese were cut off from the contemporary development of mainland China. And during the period when Formosa was under Japanese rule, the Chinese government gave no indication of a protest or bitterness or any longing for the island. When Japan surrendered in 1945, the Supreme Allied Command in the Pacific instructed the nationalist Chinese authorities to accept the surrender of Formosa from the Japanese and to temporarily undertake military occupation as a trustee of the Allies. It is to be noted, it's a military occupation, not a transfer of a sovereignty. The nationalist Chinese occupation was replete with admi male administration, corruption, atrocities, and deprivations of human rights. Thus, Formosan rage exploded on February 28, 1947 after the Chinese police killed a Formosan woman for selling untaxed cigarettes. An island-wide popular uprising was brutally suppressed. During the 228 incident of February 28, 1947, as the event is remembered by the Taiwanese, some 20,000 Taiwanese leaders from all walks of life were seized, 
tortured, and then massacred in March 1947 by the occupation forces and reinforcements sent by Chiang Kai-shek from the Chinese mainland. The Taiwanese leaders who survived this massacre by the Chinese occupation forces either went abroad or underground to struggle for self-determination and independence for Taiwan. Thus began the worldwide Taiwan independence movement of today. A movement which, according to recent reports from Peking, worries Peking more than, quote, Chiang Kai-shek or all US troops on Taiwan, unquote. Defeated by the Chinese communists and repudiated by the Chinese people, Chiang Kai-shek fled to Taiwan in the fall of 1949. The remnants of his military and civilian personnel were transported by the US Navy to Taiwan. Betraying the trust of the Allied powers, the Chiang Kai-shek regime has usurped the sovereign power of the Taiwanese people and made Taiwan a garrison police state. With the support of the United States, the Chiang regime has sought to perpetuate the fiction that it is the only legitimate government of China and hence imposes on the people of Taiwan the governmental structure that was created to govern mainland China. Under the fraudulent and fictitious schemes, it has systematically denied effective political power to the Taiwanese. Members of the three congressional bodies who were elected by the constituencies on the Chinese mainland in 1947 and 1948 for three or six year terms and later fled to Formosa are still kept in office in Formosa without ever being elected by the people of Taiwan. For more than 20 years, no election has been held in Taiwan to replace these mainland representatives. Of the 15 million people on Taiwan today, 13 million are native Taiwanese and 2 million are Chinese mainlanders. The Taiwanese comprise 87% of Taiwan's population yet they are allowed only 3% representation in the congressional bodies. There are only 32 Taiwanese out of the 1,448 members in the National Assembly which elect the president and the vice president. There are only 17 Taiwanese out of the 447 members in the legislative house, which is in charge of legislation and appropriation. And there are only six Taiwanese out of the 74 members in the control house, which is empowered to censure, impeach, audit, and give consent to key presidential appointments. As might be expected, some spokesmen for the native Formosans have demanded that this anomalous political situation be corrected so that the popular aspirations of the present population of Taiwan receive realistic representation at every level of decision making. The fact is, however, that these demands have time and again dismissed by the Chiang Kai-shek regime on the ground that the existing constitutional situation in Taiwan, though indeed extraordinary, is normal than temporary. Its contention is that as soon as the nationalist government recovers the lost territories of the Chinese mainland, 
there will be a nationwide election, and Taiwan, of course, will be included. This is what they say. Hence, Chiang Kai-shek's government argues further, the proper solution lies not in modifying the existing constitutional structure to elect a representative according to Formosa's present population, but rather in marshalling every effort to achieve what is professed to be the common goal, a return to the mainland, quote unquote. Once the mainland is recovered, it is alleged all problems on Taiwan will be solved. Meanwhile, the Taiwanese are told to be grateful that after all they enjoy voting rights to elect local officers such as members of a county, city council, magistrates, mayors, and members of the provincial assembly of Taiwan. Incidentally, Although Taiwan is alleged to be a province of, by the Chinese nationalist regime, the people of Taiwan do not enjoy the right to elect their own governor. The governor of Taiwan has been appointed as a rule by Chiang Kai-shek from top nationalist generals. The obvious result of such a grand scheme of fraud and fiction is, of course, to perpetuate the monopoly of power by the nationalist Chinese regime and to deny native Formosans effective participation in the top-level decision-making and execution. Taiwanese who protested this deprivation of the most minimum of political rights often found themselves kidnapped tortured, arrested, tried without due process of law by a military tribunal, and sentenced to death or to imprisonment in a concentration camp. Sustained by the continuous imposition of martial law for 22 years since 1949, the reign of a terror and coercion of the Chiang Kai-shek's exile regime extends to all Taiwanese, both at home and abroad. It has systematically suppressed the Taiwanese from telling the American people and the rest of the world community about the true aspirations and grievances of the Taiwanese. The Taiwanese have been denied the right of self-determination, the right of self-expression, and the right of self-government. Essential to the maintenance of Chiang Kai-shek's fiction and his dictatorial rule of the Taiwanese people is, as well known, the support of the United States government. When the Korean War broke out in June 1950, the United States considered Formosa strategically important and immediately declared the neutralization of Formosa. Supported and recognized by the United States as China, the Chiang Kai-shek regime, which was repudiated by the Chinese people, has sat on top of the Taiwanese. At the height of the Cold War, Jiang entered into alliance with the United States, and Taiwan became a U.S. base for the containment of a red China. The Taiwanese soldiers were sent to Kimoi and Machu against their will. Naturally, Chiang Kai-shek's propaganda machine was at full gear in the United States and in the United Nations. The Taiwanese whose voice was silenced by Chiang's secret police were, as usual, treated as pawns. As the configuration of world politics changes, 
the Nixon administration dismantles the old policy of containment, and the real China enters the United Nations. The Nixon administration has embarked, the, embarked on the long march of dealing with the real China and of dumping the synthetic China made in USA. Knowing full well the love-hate syndrome of Americans toward China, Peking has skillfully manipulated the strategy of a visa-itis. That is to say, no visa to China for those who fail to echo that Taiwan is a part of China. Thus, prominent Americans, one after another, have succumbed to Peking's blackmail. Peking has asked Americans to redeem their past wrongs. For the moment, communist Chinese leaders are not talking in terms of American blood or American taxpayers' money. All they are asking is Taiwan. They want Taiwan badly. Because by possessing Taiwan, communist China could double their external trade overnight. It is significant to note the current annual external trade volume of Taiwan is $4 billion, the same as that of mainland China. And you can relate that to the size of the uh, territories and population of both entities. So there is a current crack, wise crack, to the effect that uh, America cannot live without intercourse with 800 million Chinese, but can do without the 15 million people on Taiwan. And as a result, the Taiwanese become the sacrificial animals of the Washington Peking rapprochement. These developments have had an extraordinary impact on Taiwan itself. In addition to the accelerated effort of the Taiwan independence movement, scholars, students, clergymen, and business leaders suddenly began to voice political opinions which would have been condemned as seditious or treasonous scant months before always skirting the delicate and dangerous question of the legitimacy of the Chiang Kai-shek family on Taiwan. This political chorus has reiterated two points. First, the people of Taiwan, including the small minority of exiled mainlanders who have sought refuge on the island state, want to control their own destiny and do not want to be delivered to the People's Republic of China. Second, participation in all branches of government must in fact represent and realistically reflect the true aspirations of the present population of Taiwan and not the fictional aspirations of the population of China in 1949. There seems to be a certain international reluctance to address these demands squarely. Inexplicably, the 15 million people of Taiwan seems to have dropped below a threshold of international political visibility. While the United Nations has resolved the question of which government represents China in the United Nations, it has not resolved the controversy about the status of Taiwan. Though the Chinese nationalist regime continues to control Taiwan, the question of who owns Taiwan and who represents the people of Taiwan remains to be solved. The peace treaty with Japan concluded in 1951 in San Francisco, 
affirm the colonial status of Taiwan and kept its international legal status undetermined pending an international settlement. The wartime desire to return Formosa to China after the war expressed by four allied powers in the Cairo and Potsdam declarations was neither endorsed nor put into effect by the 51 allies that participated in the conclusion of the Japanese Peace Treaty in 1951. According to the Japanese Peace Treaty, Japan renounced all her rights, title, and claim to Taiwan. But the treaty did not specify any beneficiary. It did not specify to whom was Formosa to be delivered. This omission was neither negligence nor oversight, nor was it intended to imply that Taiwan belonged to China. The parties to the peace treaty were in agreement that the rapid restoration of a peaceful relations between the Allied powers and Japan must not be hindered or unduly delayed by such a highly controversial issues as the ultimate disposition of Taiwan. Therefore, the prevailing expectation at that time was that the legal status of Taiwan, though temporarily left undetermined, will be subject to further international settlement at the later date in the light of the purposes and the principles of the United Nations Charter, particularly the principle of self-determination. that the legal status of Taiwan, though temporarily left undetermined, will be subject to further international settlement at the later date in the light of the purposes and the principles of the United Nations Charter, particularly the principle of self-determination. This position was scrupulously adhered by the successive administrations of the United States government for 20 years until the demarche of the Shanghai communique of this year. The radical reversal of the United States legal position toward Taiwan is in violation of international law, the United Nations Charter, treaty obligations, and the norms of international morality and human rights. In the Shanghai communique, the United States talks about self-determination for the people of Indochina. And China talks about self-determination for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Why not self-determination for the people of Taiwan? What the outcome would be if the people of Taiwan were afforded the opportunity to exercise the right of self-determination today, given freedom of choice, the overwhelming majority of the people of Taiwan would favor explicit formalization of an independent state of Taiwan, free from any foreign domination, including that of Chinese nationalists and communists. Formal recognition of Taiwan and China as two separate independent entities, Taiwan as Taiwan, and China as China would remove the source of attention and provocation arising from the two rival regimes each claiming to be the state of China. It would contribute constructively to the cause of world peace 
justice and human rights. Through such a procedure, the independent state of Taiwan would gain wide international recognition and acceptance. It will be less vulnerable to unilateral challenge by any outside power. It would thus help stabilize the expectations that Taiwan is an independent state of country toward which no use or threat of use of force would be permissible and from which none would emanate. The form of government on Taiwan emerging from such a procedure would also gain a solid internal legitimacy and command the popular support of its people. It will thus help achieve a more secure and viable domestic public order. Meanwhile, the fear on the part of Peking will wither away when the Chinese nationalist pretensions have been discarded and Formosa emerges formally as an independent republic with no territorial claims whatever to China. The People's Republic of China could be more easily reconciled to an independent state of Taiwan when they were convinced that the state of Taiwan truly belongs to its people and is not a puppet of any foreign power. Instead of a continuing her threat to liberate Taiwan, quote unquote, China should respect and recognize the inalienable right of the Taiwanese people to decide their own destiny. An independent state of Taiwan would be an ideal buffer and neutral state in the Far East where the major powers confront one another, notably the United States, China, Japan, and the Soviet Union. It would free the United States from the embarrassment and dangers connected with the pretensions of the Chinese nationalist regime. Instead of upsetting the balance of a power by seeking to dominate and control Taiwan, it will be in the common interest of all the big powers concerned to see to it that Taiwan will be governed by the indigenous population and not to be dictated by any outside power. Taiwan is Taiwan. China is China. They are two separate political entities. To the Taiwanese, Jiang Kai-shek is an invading dictator who has usurped the power of the Taiwanese people. To the Taiwanese, the People's Republic of China is a foreign country with which they have never had a contact. Ever since its founding 22 years ago, the People's Republic of China has never extended its control and jurisdiction over Taiwan. Formosa belongs to the Formosan people. The future of the Formosan people is not and never was an internal affair of China. If human rights and self-determination mean anything, the future of Taiwan is for the people of Taiwan to decide, not for the Chinese or mainland China to decide. The freedom and independence of the Taiwanese people are not for sale. The Taiwanese people are committed to secure their freedom, their independence at all costs. As President Woodrow Wilson said, let me quote, no peace can last or ought to last 
which does not recognize and accept the principle that governments derive all their just powers from the consent of the governed, and that no right anywhere exists to hand the people about from sovereignty to sovereignty as if they were property." Unquote. The age for trading people like sand and rock, like a piece of a property, is long past. The world community cannot ask and certainly cannot expect the Taiwanese people to remain like sitting ducks to be transferred from one alien master to another. The future of Taiwan should be decided by the people of Taiwan. It is high time that the American people and the United States government support self-determination for the people of Taiwan. Thank you. We thank Dr. Chen for his in-depth analysis of the situation in Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Chen has agreed to uh, entertain questions uh, from the floor, but uh, yes. As I indicated, you see, the Taiwanese migrated to Taiwan almost at the same time the pilgrims landed in this country, and very much for the same purpose. They were seeking freedom, freedom from Chinese authoritarian rule, and they were seeking a new frontier to pursue a happier life. And certainly, in the course of the 400 years history, the Taiwanese people have undergone many, many experiences uniquely Taiwanese, even though it is a fact that the Taiwanese have uh, inherited many Chinese culture heritages. And as I indicated, during the 18th and 19th century, the people of Taiwan were there. They were developing their own land. The Chinese government on the Chinese mainland was claiming the island, but only in name, rather than in terms of effective government and effective control. And when Formosa was ceded to Japan in 1895, and that's to say from 1895 to 1945, Formosa under Japanese rule was certainly receiving a great deal of impact from that particular fact. At that time, the Taiwanese population were cut off from the contemporary development, the 20th century development on mainland China, either nationalist or communist. The Taiwanese practically were cut off from that. And in fact, um, despite the fact that um, the Japanese rule in Taiwan was in every sense of the word colonial, but on the other hand, the economic and social developments were such that uh, Formosa emerged dur even during that period as second to Japan in the whole Asia. In fact, um, in by 1939, the per capita external trade volume of uh, Taiwan was uh, nine th 39 times that of uh, mainland China. No wonder, in 1935, Chiang Kai-shek sent his envoy, Chen Yi, who was the governor of the Fukien province at that time, and later became the first governor general of Taiwan after the World War II. When Chen Yi came to Taiwan in 1935, he congratulated how fortunate Taiwanese were in being Japanese citizens. And actually, Chen Yi dis dispatched a special envoy to study the construction of an achievement of the Japanese government on Taiwan and wrote a report in which it Chinese did the classify 
different uh, groups of the Taiwanese at that time, they said the uh, bulk of the population, about more than 90% Taiwanese and about 1% Chinese, that is Chinese from mainland China. And in any event, all these certainly have a very, very strong impact on the uh, shaping of the perspective, the demands, and the identity of the part of the Taiwanese. And up at the end of World War II, when Chiang Kai-shek forces came to occupy the island, Chiang came as an army of liberation. But soon, the Taiwanese found out they were more of a conquerors rather than liberators. And as I indicate in the blood massacre of 1947 and so on, from that point on, the Taiwanese had no illusion whatever. They realized that unless they have a country, a government of their own, they could not even get their basic survival, the basic protection of human rights. And all this add up simply to say the history of the Taiwanese people is very much like the, the history of the American people or any other people. Certainly your ancestors took with them the European, the British heritages, but today I'm sure you will be very proud to identify yourself as a, a human being first and American second, and same with Taiwanese. They will say, I'm a human being, but I'm also proud to be Taiwanese. Yes, Mr. Lin. Right. Our yes, our former name is called World United Formosans for Independence. World United Formosans for Independence. It's the uh, unified worldwide organization Formosans dedicated to the establishment of an independent state of Taiwan in accordance with the principle of self-determination. We are opposed to Chinese or any other foreign domination or control of Taiwan. And our organization is committed to implement the goals of a Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international human rights conventions. We want to have a free, democratic, independent republic in the future. And the headquarters are in the United States. The branches are in the inside the island of Taiwan, in Japan, in Canada, in Western Europe. And we are articulating, speaking on behalf of what we call the 13 million silenced Taiwanese majority in Taiwan. Because what we are saying is, what I'm saying here tonight will not be able to be uh, expressed by any Taiwanese back in Taiwan openly. Anybody dares to that will immediately find their themselves somewhere in the concentration camps or disappear totally. And we do have a very widespread support of the Taiwanese population, both here and abroad. And the overwhelming majority of the Taiwanese here do contribute and support the uh, movement and the organization. Uh, I, I like to, uh, to open this to everybody. So I'd like to have everybody who, will, who has their hands up uh, have a chance to ask questions. Of course, it has to be underground. We would wish uh, the Chiang Kai-shek government would, uh, you know, welcome uh, a legitimate uh, popular airing. But the Chiang Kai-shek regime has uh, suppressed, has uh, not allowed any real opposition party to come to the open. So necessarily, those people have to operate underground. And you can testify the fact that you can see from the fact that the martial law has been imposed on the people of Taiwan since 1949. The Chiang Kai-shek regime continues to say Formosa is in a state of emergency. And uh, during the period of a communist rebellion, that's what they use. You know, the civil, political, other human rights need to be suspended and deprived. And a civilian in Taiwan can be easily court-martialed for a common crime or for a crime without, for what, you see. Yes, thank you. If, uh, I would assume that if the vast majority of the members of the armed forces in Taiwan are Taiwanese, and how does the, the, the majority of the Taiwanese resent the uh, rule of Chiang Kai-shek? Mm -hmm. How was Chiang Kai-shek able to, to 
stole the military and uh, like you know when I became the military just like you know just overthrow them so they seem to become a the vast majority of them so well it's Uncle Sam <laughs> you know uh, certainly today the Taiwanese comprise 85 percent of the uh, armed forces in Taiwan but uh, when the United States was uh, firmly behind the Chiang Kai-shek regime, that is to say, for the Taiwanese freedom fighters, they would have to up against not only the Chiang Kai-shek regime, but the master behind him. And that is why for a long time, the Taiwanese people were struggling, struggling, so on. But now is a very critical moment. The Taiwanese realize it's their opportunity, we would simply have to seize the opportunity and uh, mobilize all the resources, all the manpower at our disposal. But uh, I'm sure, <laughs> don't be surprised someday when something happens, you know, said, oh, the Taiwanese are doing something, but uh, when it's quiet, you would raise that question. This is not some sort of question you could really quantify, but the matter of fact is, so many political prisoners fighting for the independence of Taiwan have been arrested, tortured, and done with. You see, this simply shows, all. for instance, you see, when uh, some Taiwanese tried to start a coup d'etat but were suppressed, and that news didn't get reported anywhere in the uh, island of Taiwan or abroad. And what you knew, again, was uh, the information from the underground network. The, the Well, I think it's several, several ways. First of all, when the uh, Chiang Kai-shek regime was uh, recognized and supported as the government of uh, China, that regime was very powerful and strong abroad, internationally, and the Chiang Kai-shek's propaganda machine was quite effective in terms of the China lobby for some time. And at that time, the voice of the Formosan simply went unheeded. And for the Taiwanese people, they always thought uh, when they tried to control their own destiny, they wanted to have the minimum assurance that the United States would not be on the side to supply armament and whatever assistance to the uh, Chiang Kai-shek regime to suppress the expression of their legitimate aspirations. And that was a very important factor. Secondly, of course, uh, the Chiang Kai-shek regime was quite skillful in playing the uh, policy of divide and rule to divide in little, many little groups and all create uh, the so-called Uncle Tom types of Formosans to uh, govern them for some time. But that could, like Lincoln, they could fool people some of the time, but not all the time. And another point, which uh, I think, as I somewhat uh, related in my presentation, that is after the 1947 massacre, there has been a very strong conviction or belief on the part of the Taiwanese that if they have to act, they would have to act decisively. Otherwise, they would simply result in sacrifices. Of course, that sacrifices the Taiwanese are suffering today. But on the other hand, the uh, critical moment is when the Chiang Kai-shek regime has been liquidated, has been eroded in terms of its uh, external power basis, then unless that regime were able to accommodate the real demands of the people, then certainly the whole situation would be uh, pointing to that uh, direction. In the independent Republic of Taiwan, all the people of Taiwan, by the people of Taiwan, I include the mainlanders and Taiwanese, they will all be the citizens of Taiwan. And of course, if the Taiwanese or mainlanders, whoever choose to leave the island and do not want to identify with the, tai the island of Taiwan, with a new republic, they should be free to do so, and they should be given every assistance. But if for those who choose to stay and to show their allegiance to the new Republic of Taiwan, they should be treated as the citizens of Taiwan and to be accorded equal and effective protection in every way. 
in terms of a participation in power and economic, cultural, or social sectors. It seems to me that uh, to accord equal protection, equal guarantee to mainlanders within the framework of the new Republic of Taiwan will be essential, will be vital for the common interest of all the people living on Taiwan. It is not just a matter of a humanitarian concern, certainly that element is there, but much more is there. That is to say, those mainlanders, after all, you know, Taiwan is no different from other territories, other countries. People do migrate to a particular territory at a different time. And of course, uh, in the past two decades, there have been quite sufficient time to, for these people to identify with the island of Taiwan. But because of the uh, policy of the Chiang Kai-shek regime of a uh, divided rule and also the mis mystical rule, the mainlanders have not been able to identify with the island of Taiwan. But I think when the new republic is established, all this communication problem, all the identity crisis could be uh, more easily solved. Uh, two more questions. You It is not the creation of uh, two countries out of one. Actually, Taiwan and China coexist, and Taiwan as Taiwan, China as China. And as I pointed out in my presentation, Taiwan was a Japanese colony for 50 years, from 1894, 95 to 1945. At the end of World War II, after World War II, the Taiwanese people do not have the fortune of the other, other former colonial people in Asia or Africa. They have all attained their right of self-determination. They have attained their statehood, their independence. But why Taiwanese have not been uh, given that opportunity? Because the Taiwanese have the misfortune of ruled by the yellow people rather than white people. If the Chiang Kai-shek regime Chiang happened to be white people, then the world community would easily recognize, particularly by the members of the third world, this is the colonial issue, pure and simple. But the very fact that the Chiang Kai-shek regime has been able to project all sorts of a very mess, it sort of obscures the understanding of uh, many people. And one thing I think is uh, very instructive. I remember in the 1971 discussion, debate on the China question, the representative of Nigeria. I don't know where you come from, but uh, the, oh, oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> <coughs> you are ambassador to the United Nations. One would think he would be most hesitant to speak anything in terms of self-determination for the people of Taiwan or that. But he quoted my article appear in the New York Times or other materials indicating the Taiwanese have been denied the right to govern themselves. And he was able to speak in those terms, even given the background of Biafra. He simply didn't see the Formosa issue as uh, something comparable to Biafra and Nigeria. He was able to see the Formosan people are uh, people that have been denied the right to decide their own destiny. So he did speak that in those terms and distinguish the case of Formosa from uh, any possible case of cessation. And this is, seems to me that uh, if uh, the Taiwanese people or the uh, world community are able to make the uh, whole Formosa issue very clear, then the countries in the third world would understand that. As a matter of fact, uh, in an article just written by a colleague of mine and me on who owns Taiwan, an international title search, this piece has been published by the Year Law Journal. And we come to the conclusion, if one has to characterize the status of Taiwan, it is the non-self-governing territory in the terms of the United Nations Charter. And it should be coming within the jurisdiction of the committee, the colonial, you know, the colonization committee.
you mean have the choice now or I guess it will be very hard to say in terms of percentage, but I should think, you see, if you think uh, very, very deeper, you certainly see that uh, the mainland Chinese, most of them in Taiwan today, do share the same fate as the people of Taiwan, as the Taiwanese people. After all, they were victims of the historical development, and for the mainlanders on Taiwan, who have been identified with the Kuomintang, with the Chiang Kai-shek's party for so long, certainly they would have a very deep sense of insecurity if in any event communist Chinese should come over to take Taiwan. So the critical point, it seems to me, will be these people will have to feel very secure that they can really identify with Taiwan. They can lead a decent and peaceful and happy life on the island of Taiwan. And if that is the case, I'm sure most of them will choose to stay. Uh, of course, I can't speak for the time. <laughs> uh, we, we do uh, have uh, coffee and cookies in that corner. And uh, Dr. Chen will stay around. He won't, he won't run away. And he will stay around and to talk with you. And I think at this point, we shall terminate uh, this discussion, formal discussion. But you're welcome to stay some coffee and cookies and talk to Dr. Chen. Thank you for coming. Yeah, okay, we're